There are a million paths in this world. But they can all be reduced to one. Imagine if in the story, Naruto, Rock Lee was the main character instead, but he was incredibly smart and resourceful, and we begin with him at the very start of his journey to become powerful. Also in this story, the Hidden Leaf Village is the weakest village in the entire world, and Rock Lee must adventure out to the other villages to become stronger so that one day he can defend his village from a giant demon. I find this a very simple way to explain the basic gist of the story of Cradle by Will White. Cradle is a progression fantasy, which is basically the same thing as a battle shonen, and it is a fantastic series. I love Cradle so much that immediately upon finishing the series, it was on my bucket list to read it again before I die. The series is so popular that the creator, Will White, god of the weebs, did a kickstarter to get the series animated, and after getting over a million dollars, we should see the fruit of that pretty soon. It is in my mind that if we had to send out a representative of each genre fiction to aliens in outer space, I would want Cradle to represent battle shonen or progression fantasy, as it highlights the best aspects of the genre while also not falling to the main pitfalls that most battle shonen do. In Cradle, there is power creep, but it makes complete sense, and it is explained very well and almost every single power-up in the series is well-earned. There's a cast of characters that all feel important, and they grow alongside the main character. They don't suffer the Dragon Ball effect, where characters like Yamcha and Tien, while strong in their own rights, are incredibly weak compared to the main characters of Goku and Vegeta. Furthermore, there are a plethora of great villains throughout this 12-volume series. Politics, while often excluded in Battle Shonen or glossed over, are ingrained into the Cradle series very well, and leads to very interesting dynamics that can turn some heroes into the greatest of villains. On top of that, those who pay attention to every little line will be rewarded, as foreshadowing in Cradle is top-notch. It holds several great plot twists, including one that I believe to be on par with the likes of the reveal of Lucius Sagratus. I am genuinely in love with this series and its characters. I firmly believe that once Cradle gets animated, it will rise to the heights of Avatar The Last Airbender. And today, I want to go over the different aspects of this Cradle series and explain why they are amazing and why you should take the time to read it. I will be including minor spoilers, but nothing that would ruin the series for you. I will leave a link down below to where you can get the first book. If you have access to Kindle Unlimited, you get all the books for free, and Cradle does have the advantage that it is a series that is finished, and I do believe it sticks the landing, which is why I think I put it above a lot of other series. For example, I've been known to be the Black Clover guy, but Cradle is just so good that it actually surpassed Black Clover for me. The main character of Cradle is Wei Shi Linden. He lives in Sacred Valley, and despite being 15 years old, He's treated both as a young child and a disgrace because he is unsold. In the Sacred Valley, young children perform a ritual with an elder where they place their hand in a bowl of magically empowered water. The shape the water takes determines one of the paths the children will have, but because Linden was not given any path from the water bowl ritual, he is unsold, making him a disgrace to the clan and giving him an incredibly hard life in the Sacred Valley, where everybody performs what is called Sacred Arts. Sacred Arts is a form of magical martial arts that basically runs society. Because Linden is unsold, he's basically on his own for advancing through the different ranks and the Sacred Arts. So in Book 1, he is stuck at the Foundation stage, which is the lowest rank on the system. At this stage, his peers are 7 and 8 year olds, and part of the reason why Linden is stuck at this Foundation rank is because he does not receive the same level of training or resources as the other people in his family or clan. Strictly because he is unsold. Early into the first book, during a sacred arts tournament, an evil god descends upon Sacred Valley and starts killing everybody. Luckily, a phoenix goddess of rebirth comes down before it can do too much damage, and because of her control over fate and causality, she can reverse all the deaths. But before she can stop him, she sees Linden, one of the weakest souls in Sacred Valley, try to stop this evil god. Because of his bravery, she decides to reveal multiple fates to Linden, different fates he could face down the line. And she reveals that Sacred Valley, 30 years from now, will be attacked by a giant demon that is called a Dread God. This is a beast so massive that it wades through mountains like water, and Linden and his family, and almost the entire Sacred Valley, will die. The sacred artists of Sacred Valley would be less than fleas in comparison. She tells Linden that he has a possible fate of saving Sacred Valley if he leaves it, and pursues sacred arts far more advanced than the Sacred Valley is known for. So she tells him of the disciple of the sword sage Yaren, and he heads off in her direction as the phoenix believes that the sword disciple 
can lead Linden down a path to become strong enough to save Sacred Valley. And the story progresses from here on out. Over the books, Linden slowly gets more people to join his party. He learns vastly more complicated sacred arts than he could ever have dreamed of in Sacred Valley, and he becomes significantly more powerful. Not only that, but I think Linden as a character progresses as well. One of the critiques of Cradle is that in the beginning books, Linden doesn't have much of a character. But the genius of Will White is that the reason why he doesn't have much of a character is because of how neglected he is in society. And as more books goes on, and as Linden gets stronger, he does get character progression that goes alongside his power progression. He acts more confident. He's more likely to not take shit. I don't want to go too much into Linden in this video because of spoiler reasons, but if you guys end up liking Cradle videos, I will definitely do a whole video about him. But it's just hard to analyze a character completely and not spoil too much. The next character I want to talk about, her name is Yaren. She is basically that main girl character of a battle shonen, but Yaren is by far best girl. This is coming from a Noelle stan. Noelle is one of my favorite characters ever, and Yaren, I don't think it's just a better character, but I think she's way better. And the best part about the relationship and connections between Linden and Yaren is that it's done, and it ends well in the final book. But the reason why I like Yaren is part of having to do with the dynamic between her and Linden. The series starts off with Linden being at the very bottom of the power system, and Yaren being much higher but also because she was the disciple of the Sword Sage, is way stronger than her rank, which is why she can typically fight people that were ranked above her in the power system because of her skills. So it leads to these very interesting interactions where Yaren is constantly saving Linden, but Linden will occasionally save her, often in an interesting way because he's not strong enough. That's what's really good at the beginning of Cradle is that Linden is very weak and most of the ways he has to win or progress is through his mind. This is finding strategies where he can win or even cheating to win. And that meshes well with Yaren when they can work together using her power and his smarts. She has her own character arc that is foreshadowed from the very beginning and then it culminates into a great ending for her character. She's a badass and I just love how rough she is. She's kind of like a, a little bit more tame Mirliona with a much better character arc. Her power is basically sword magic but it's a lot more complex than that. She has what is called a gold sign, and her gold sign are mechanical arms that come out from her back and can act as blades. And because she's on the path of the endless sword, she basically gets stronger with every single sword strike. It's almost like her ability is similar to Jack the Ripper in terms of getting stronger or faster with each slash. The final protagonist that I'll be mentioning for now is Athan Aurelius. He is the fan favorite character, and he is my favorite character as well. He's essentially the mentor or sensei figure in the series for both Linden and Yaren. He is similar to Gojo, even the author has stated this but sorry he's just a way better gojo it is just blatantly stated in jujutsu kaisen that gojo is not great at teaching his students whereas athan is exactly the opposite he is a great teacher he's also way funnier than gojo and imagine if instead of gojo having infinity he had anti-magic that's Ethan. Ethan comes from an ancient house that has a lot of power, money, and resources. Because of this, he's able to essentially fund Linden and Yaren's cultivation throughout the series. Though, of course, he also partakes in his own hands-on training. I can't really tell too deeply into this character because I don't want to spoil. He's just genuinely one of my favorite characters in all of Battle Shonen. In fact, as I'm thinking about it right now, I struggle finding a character as good as him. And I have read a lot of manga and watched a lot of anime. One of the best things about Cradle is its world building. Even though it is a massive world, the author goes out of his way to put it in little tidbits early in the series that are foreshadowing for a big reveal about the world later on. And because the world is so ingrained to both the power system and the main characters, the world constantly feels like its own living, breathing character. It is actually explained why some kingdoms are just way stronger than the other, and they often make so much sense, which is something that usually doesn't happen a lot in other series of this genre. Sometimes it can feel contrived why some kingdoms are so weak or some are so strong not in Cradle. But one of the best things about the world building is the power system. There are various aspects involved with the sacred arts. The primary energy system of the sacred arts is called Madra. Sacred artists use Madra to reinforce their body and also perform very impressive techniques that are akin to spells. This can range anywhere from covering your body in black fire or commanding a concept to affect other people. Now you might be thinking, are these elements or attributes like the four main elements of fire, water, wind, and air? And the answer is yes, but there essentially is an infinite amount of paths. 
Think of almost anything, and there is going to be a madra path for that. And what I find interesting about these sacred arts is that you typically choose your path. Your core determines your path, and how sacred artists get more madra or choose their path is through cycling aura. Aura is a physical energy that resides in nature, that emanates from whatever concept is giving it off. For example, an area with a lot of swords would have a lot of sword aura, which would then be converted to sword madra. So whenever a young sacred artist cycles the aura of the area, they will become a sacred artist on that path. And while there's only one path per core, many sacred artists can manipulate the aura of different paths. For example, imagine a character has a lightning path ingrained into their core. They have lightning-based abilities, but they can still manipulate wind aura, and it's more like airbending rather than magic, where they're not really creating it, they are manipulating what is already there. Within these sacred arts, there are four main abilities that characters draw from. There are forger techniques, which are essentially creating objects with madra that can appear as physical or magical constructs. Striker techniques are concentrations of power to be used to hit opponents or targets from various ranges. Reinforcer techniques relies on using madra to reinforce the body to even higher degrees than normal. And finally, Ruler Techniques, which is my favorite and one of the cooler techniques in the entire series. Ruler Techniques remind me of Mana Zone from Black Clover, but actually even more interesting. How Ruler Techniques work is that you can expand the technique throughout an entire area and take use of the aura that matches your Madra path. For example, Yaren uses a Ruler Technique that takes advantage of all sword aura in the area, meaning that anything with a sharp edge becomes her ally including the swords of her opponents, or even sharp rocks in the area. So it actually is interesting because this story will often make the environments a part of the battle because of how important ruler techniques are to the power system and the fights of the series. But what I think to be the most interesting part of the series is the ranking system. You guys all know ranking systems in manga and anime. One Punch Man as S-Class Heroes, Jujutsu Kaisen as Special Grade Sorcerers, and Black Clover as Stage Zero Mages. Now, most of the time, I feel like these ranking systems just aren't very good because it sets up a lot of contradictions. And in a lot of these series, they're just not usually expanded upon. And a lot of the times, they're just like, oh, this character is this strong, and that's it. And that's what all that ranking means. It's all about power. This is very different within Cradle. While, yes, if you look at the ranking system, if somebody is higher than the other, then they will have a higher chance of winning that fight against a lower ranked character. But lower ranked characters fight and defeat upper ranked characters all the time in Cradle. As different things like the amount of Madra you have, your control of your Madra, your own physical strength, what type of Madra path you're on, etc. All of those things will change how the fight goes, not just the rank of how far you've progressed your soul. In Cradle, you will consistently see characters one or two ranks apart able to have good fights still. But also, each rank in the Cradle system isn't a rank that determines how much power you have, it's how much you've transformed and progressed your soul or your core. Making it so that each rank a character progresses actually almost feels more like a transformation rather than just a rank up. When the story starts, we are only aware of a few ranks in the sacred arts. At the foundation level, which is primarily comprised of young children, they can use Madra to reinforce their bodies or activate simple scripts, which are like runes. When they advance to copper, they get copper sight, allowing them to see vital aura, which allows them to begin cycling to strengthen their madra and choose their path. When they advance to iron, they get an iron body, making them much stronger and faster, more durable, but also improving all of their senses. What's even more interesting is that there are several types of iron bodies that you can choose from. For example, one character gets what's called a blood-forged iron body. It was much harder to get than a regular iron body, but it's worth it in the end, as that makes them regenerate much more faster while also making them resistant to poisons. On top of an iron rank is a jade. Jade gets even greater spiritual senses and can develop better cycling techniques to develop their madra channels. When we start in the first book of Cradle, these are the only ranks that are there, because in Sacred Valley, there has not been a gold rank in hundreds of years. But note, even though there are big gaps in power between the different ranks, what I find very interesting is that each rank gives you something else besides just a power-up. And also, some of these rank-ups you don't get just by getting stronger. For example, the main way to advance from Jade to Gold is by absorbing a remnant into your core. Remnants are essentially hollows, the magical ghosts left behind by dead sacred artists or sacred beasts. Not only do you get a lot stronger when you absorb this remnant, but you also typically gain what's called a gold sign. Oftentimes, gold signs can actually give you added benefit. For example, when Yaren became a gold, she gained a bunch of mechanical arms at her side that acted as swords. And what I love is that as the sacred artist advances to higher levels, they can access basically new power systems. For example, there's one of these ranks where once you discover a spiritual realization about yourself, you rank up. And on top of that, your whole body gets recovered and advanced and also improves Madra channels. That means if you have some unhealable wound or scars, if you progress to this rank, it would completely restore your body 
and make it better than it ever was. On top of that, you get access to a whole new power system called Soul Fire. This is a type of power that is drawn from your soul. If you go even further, there are characters that get the ability to use the authority of their willpower, and how that is enacted within the series is by taking control and command of a concept. These concepts are called icons. For example, think of a sacred artist had an ability to manipulate time, or had a time mod or path. If they use that over and over again and progress, well, they might gain access to the time icon, giving them the conceptual regulation of time that goes beyond the power system of Madra itself. Yes, they are able to do things that are not even powered by Madra, but powered by their own willpower. What's crazy is that because it's ran by willpower, characters can have essentially infinite power as long as they don't run out of willpower or remain conscious. What's really cool about this is that sacred artists who reach this level combine the powers of their Madra with their authority to control an icon, combining what seems to be multiple different power systems to make something much more powerful than they originally could have. One aspect that I like about the sacred arts power system is that while there is so much benefit to a advancement, advancing too fast can lead to very negative consequences. If you advance to a certain rank too fast, it might negatively affect your body or soul, and you might be stuck in that rank for a long time, possibly forever. This leads to interesting different ways where characters have to rank up or are worried about ranking up, but they have to anyways. Finding different ways to advance, to sidestep these negative side effects, or just advance anyways and making interesting relationship to characters with lots of resources that will help you mitigate these negative consequences. This makes the world feel really realistic because in a lot of Battle Shonen, there's not a lot of negatives to getting stronger and very fast and quick amount of times. Because for example, in other series, like, well, why isn't everybody just training like this to get this much stronger? It's kind of explained away in Cradle that most people cannot do that because if they do get too strong too fast, it'll have drawbacks. Either they just don't have the potential or they don't have the resources to get there. It adds tension and stakes to the story when characters are trying to progress and they need to progress faster faster than it would be healthy to. When Linden starts in the series in book one, he is the rank of foundation, which means that he has a long ways to go. He must rank up all the way and get to the ranks of copper, iron, jade, low gold, high gold, true gold, underlord, overlord, arclord, sage, herald, and finally, monarch. And with that, I think we should talk about the monarchs a little bit because as they stand at the peak of the power system, in the cradle story it can happen in different stories where the peak of the verse just isn't that interesting and in cradle it is literally the opposite think of the monarchs like hokage from naruto where they are both the most powerful person in their nation and they also lead said nation in cradle there are several different monarchs and they basically each run an empire or kingdom and this is what is great about the power system of cradle is that it actually props up the monarchs because they are there because of their power. Remember that they are not monarchs because they got stronger. They became monarchs by progressing their souls. And the level of power that these monarchs get lead to some very wild implications and consequences that I'm not going to get into this video for spoiler reasons. But monarchs have the power to literally fight and defeat gods. All of them are incredibly strong and have so much power. They have the ability to affect concepts and control concepts. They can easily move through space-time itself and they are so knowledgeable at the power systems and the world and even beyond that their effect on the story is to me felt a lot better. They're just honestly way better than Hokage or any sort of king title in manga or anime. My favorite monarch is called North Strider. Dude is a complete badass. He spent his entire life at the bottom of the ocean fighting massive sea serpents and dragons and he just ate them and absorbed their power because he's on the path of the hungry deep. He can just create spaces where he can just heal anybody inside of it. They cannot die. He can command concepts and take control of the dragon icon that conceptually makes him stronger. On top of that, he's an incredibly layered character who has anger against the gods from higher dimensions. And so he tries to mimic them, to rebel against them. And he has this very interesting arc with the main character trying to convince him that instead of rebelling against the gods, he should join them. To put it simply, if you want to be a part of a generational entry into the progression fantasy or battle shonen genre, you have to read Cradle. It is a series that just within two weeks after finishing reading it, I started listening to the audiobooks because I needed to experience that story again. Will White has single-handedly exploded my interest in reading again. Before, I would maybe read two to three books a year, but as of right now, I've already read 15 books this year, and I only started in February. Honestly, I think one of the greatest selling points in this series is that it's done and it nails the landing. But with that being said, let me know what you guys think of this video. And if you do end up reading or have read Cradle, let me know your thoughts down below. Because I know that once the anime gets fully done, this series is going to explode. Thank you guys so much for your support. I hope you guys all have an amazing day and peace out.